transforming the viewer into a participant radically redefines the definition of the artist, opening up the possibility that anyone and everyone is an artist. This was Boyce's view, and his concept of social sculpture is based on a belief in the artistic potential of every member of society and art's ability to bring about revolutionary change. Joseph Boyce created performance objects, installations, sculptures and drawings that challenged traditional ideas of the purpose and function of art. Boyce suggested that art might not ultimately constitute a specialised profession, but rather a heightened humanitarian attitude or way of conducting one's life in every realm of daily activity. He saw creativity as central to all aspects of human existence and engaged his audience in unprecedented provocative ways. In 1977, Documenta 6 featured the first live international satellite telecast by artists. In a compelling nine minute speech, Joseph Boyce presents a direct address to the public, elaborating on his utopian theories of art as social sculpture and expanding on his theory that art would no longer refer exclusively to the specialists within the modern art world, but extend to the whole work of humanity. To release something, what would be like a new form of art and could stand as such, he would say it is social sculpture. Sculpture, the work of art, art, that no longer has simply relation on the modern art business and the artist, but the concept of art that refers to everybody and to all questions and problems of the social organism within which human beings live. Ultimately, it is Boyce's view that artworks should be instruments of private and social change. He explored this idea in personal performances that tested his own limits. For example, I Like America and America Likes Me, where he locked himself in a gallery for three days with a live coyote so as to better connect with his animal nature. His 1982 project for Documenta 7 involved the planting of 7,000 oak trees over five years with the assistance of volunteers. Continuing for a full year after Boyce's death, it was finally completed in 1987. The work resulted in the reforestation of Cassel. Each sapling was accompanied by a four-foot stone column. So what do you think the significance of the stone column is? Why did he decide to include it? And how does it relate to the tree? Marta, pause the video here and have a quick discussion. According to the artist, the planting of 7,000 oak trees is only a symbolic beginning. And such a symbolic beginning requires a marker, in this instance, a basalt column. The intention of such a tree planting event is to point up the transformation of all life, of society, and of the whole ecological system. The combination of rigid static stone with the continuously self-transforming tree was meant to evoke the harmonious coexistence in nature of opposing states of being. Each pair was a sculptural group on its own, as well as part of an enormous social sculpture that sparked conversations about a host of social and environmental issues. Erwin Wurm places the viewer's engagement as the most important ingredient in his art. Following the tradition of Joseph Boy's social sculptures, Wurm's one-minute sculptures involved the audience participating in a series of brief performative sculptures using a variety of ordinary everyday objects, a refrigerator, plastic bottles, tennis balls. He began this series in the late 1990s, creating the works on the spot using whatever objects, participants and backgrounds were available. So how do Verm's one minute sculptures relate to Claire Bishop's notions of authorship as a motivator of participatory art? Think back to the idea that participatory art brings into question the authority of the artist as the author of the work. Surrendering some or all control is regarded as more egalitarian and democratic, and shared production benefits aesthetically from the greater risk and unpredictability. 
Verm sources the, sources the props and produces a set of instructions for visitors to perform the various sculptures for 60 seconds. However, it's up to the participants to realise the work themselves without the direct intervention of the artist. In these works, the authorship of the artist is limited and the spontaneity and unpredictability play a significant part. Through his work, Irvin Verm questions and reflects on sculpture itself seeking to overcome its traditional restrictions. Was ist das? Wie stehe ich in Beziehung dazu? Ich muss da jetzt was ausführen. Ich werde sozusagen zum Objekt selbst. Ich bin umgeben von Kunstobjekten. In welchem Verhältnis bin ich dann zu diesen Objekten hier? Wenn ich hier etwas selber mache, da kann ich aktiv sein, da nicht. Also das stellt plötzlich viele Dinge in Frage, das stellt viele Fragen plötzlich und das ist das Spannende daran. Er ist auch ein Künstler, das kann man vielleicht auch als typisch österreichisch bezeichnen, dass er mit einer gewissen Witz, mit einer gewissen Ironie eine Kommunikationsform mit dem Publikum einmal herstellt. Und über diese Schiene dann eigentlich auf eine ganz andere, natürlich viel invasivere und fast perfide Weise den Betrachter einnimmt in einen Diskurs, der viel, viel tiefer, abgründiger und vielschichtiger ist. natürlich auch darum, dass die Sache nicht gelingen, dass man eben bewusst auch das, das Scheitern, eben, dass der Ball runterfällt oder eben, dass man sich auf der Latte nicht halten kann, dass die Milchtüten eben doch vielleicht nicht stehen bleiben, dass das Scheitern, sozusagen das, das Vergebliche, sich abmühen an der perfekten Skulptur, dass das eben auch thematisiert wird, dass es schon auch um das Ironische geht, das Humorvolle, das Lustige, sich selbst auch ein bisschen eben zum, zum Hampelmann machen, aber immer auch letztlich ein Moment dabei wichtig ist, wo tatsächlich der Körper und seine, seine Grenzerfahrung erfährt bzw. an eine Grenze geführt wird. Weil man eben plötzlich Objekt ist, vom Subjekt zum Objekt wird, gibt es eine ganz andere Verhältnismäßigkeit zur Umgebung und das ist, ja, das mag natürlich nicht jeder, ist klar, aber die Arbeit braucht ja nicht immer eine Ausführung, sondern es reicht schon, wenn man sozusagen hinschaut, das liest und sich vorstellt, ich könnte das machen. Auch das ist einen Prozess in Gang, der interessant ist. Since the mid-1990s, Harold Fletcher has produced socially engaged participatory works that encourage ordinary people to tap into their creative impulses. For his 2003 project, The Sound We Make Together, Fletcher invited local groups to practice their regular recreational activities in the gallery, including a Baptist choir, a meditation class, and a breakdance team. In 2002, Harold Fletcher and Miranda July launched a collaborative online project that invited people all over the world to respond to creative assignments. Participants followed the artist's simple instructions and each submitted documentation or reports on their interpretations of each activity to be posted on the websites. Examples of assignments include make an audio recording of a choir, make a protest sign and protest, and take a picture of strangers holding hands. The project concluded in 2009, but the website continues to exist online as an archive. What I really wanted them to do was just follow the instructions and that innately they would do things differently because they were a different individual, had different skills, different aesthetic. That was really interesting to see all of these different variations on a very simple idea that were happening all over the world and you know, all, these, all these different people. And these people weren't focused on us. I mean, they were focused on themselves and what they had to express. That was the basic thing that made it so sort of addictive um, and comforting and, and inspiring. And, and 
I, just like anyone else, would just go and check to see, oh, has anyone done this assignment right. recently? And then we'd email each other, like, oh, my God, did you see this one? Right. Like, and, and, like, we were fans, you know. Yeah. So in some ways, we got to be an audience to the project that we had created. It became a dynamic relationship between, between us as, you know, the quote-unquote artists and, and the, the audience. Think about this work in relation to how we use the internet in contemporary times versus the role and function of the internet in 2002 when the project was first initiated. Pause here and have a quick discussion. And I think one of the things to keep in mind is that at the time that we started Learning to Love You More, there was no Facebook, MySpace, YouTube anything like that. The idea of making a website that was participatory seemed really interesting to us. And now because of Blogger and Tumblr and all of these, these things, people can create you know, very quickly their own blog and be, able, and be able to put onto it images, audio, video, all of those things. So they can basically reproduce what we created with the website you know, in 10 minutes. One of the things that we were really interested in was to use um, the web and use a computer as a means to get people to leave their computer. These strange little challenges that um, were available to anybody if they wanted to do them, but that meant that they would have to sort of break out of their normal sort of routine and do something a little bit different. Most of the assignments in one way or another are intended to get people to appreciate and see the, you know, the, the world around them in a different way. And that, at least for that moment, you, you go, oh, th this is actually kind of interesting. There's, there is meaning here. There's significance. Fletcher acknowledges the importance of redefining artist and audience roles. More often than not, what I'm doing is creating a structure and then allowing participants to, to fill in the actual substance of what the, the project is. Although he is the one making the decisions and providing the framework for his participatory works, he is noticeably absent during the performances themselves, unlike, for example, a performance by Marina Abramovich or a dinner cooked by Rirkrit Tirawani. That elimination of the artist as authority figure is one of the key aspects of many participatory artworks. Francis Alice's works often begin as simple actions performed by himself or volunteers which are then documented in a range of media, including photographs, films, even postcards. Many of his projects involve walks, or paseos, in which he navigates city streets accompanied by various accessories that transform the walks into metaphoric journeys. One of his first walks was The Collector, in which he pulled a magnetic toy on wheels through the streets of Mexico City. Along the way, bits of metal attached themselves to the toy, representing the random accumulation of experiences. In Paradox of Praxis, the artist pushed a large block of ice down the streets for hours until it was reduced to a puddle. And for the leak, he roamed the streets with a punctured can of paint, leaving a sort of Jackson Pollock-like breadcrumb trail back to a gallery space, where he finally mounted the empty paint can to a wall. In another street action entitled Reenactments, Elise was recorded endeavouring to walk as far as he could while holding a 9mm Beretta in his right hand. After 11 minutes, he was arrested by the police. The next day, he managed to persuade the police to take part in a reconstruction of the exact same events, including the arrest and the interactions of passers-by, as a staged performance for the camera. The resulting work projects both the original documentation and the reenactment side by side. So, what do you think the significance of this work is? What was Elise getting at?
By presenting a record of the dramatic action alongside footage of its reenactment, Elise blurs boundaries between documentation and fiction. Questioning the concept of authenticity, this work demonstrates how media can distort and dramatize the immediate reality of the moment, alluding to the violence in Mexico City in a way that Elise has sometimes felt was too sensationalized. After visiting Lima in 2000, Elise found a desperate situation that called for an epic response, at once futile and heroic, absurd and urgent in his own words. He returned in 2002 for a performance entitled When Faith Moves Mountains. During this performance, Elise recruited 500 volunteers to walk in a line up a massive 1600 foot sand dune on the outskirts of the city. Equipped with shovels, the volunteers moved the dune 10 centimetres from its original location. What do you think the significance of this action is? Why would you bother moving such a large sand dune such a small distance? hacer que una línea recta avanzara alrededor de un cono, ¿no? pero eh, un grupo humano eh, partiendo de su fe puede proponerse hacer algo que bueno, a los ojos de cualquiera resulta un imposible, pues algo absurdo, algo que sale por completo de lo racional, digámoslo así. The minuscule and temporary movement of the dune seems to dramatize a principle of maximum effort, minimal results that typifies many Latin American modernization schemes. Yet it was also a monumental achievement made by communal cooperation. For Elise, it was essential that the participants gave their time and effort for free, so that the action could stand as a model for a lavish expenditure of energy, running counter to conservative economic principles of efficiency and production. The action was filmed from various positions, and the images were distributed on postcards, embracing rumor, urban myth, and oral history. Elise aims to make the works that continue beyond the duration of the event itself, through stories disseminated by word of mouth. That the participants managed to move the dune only a small distance mattered less than the potential for myth-making in their collective act. What was made was then a powerful allegory, a metaphor for human will, and an occasion for a story to be told and potentially passed on endlessly in the oral tradition. For Elise, the transi transitory nature of such an action is the stuff of contemporary myth. These works present an investigation of methods of social action, from rehearsals and reenactments in urban environments that address the politics of public space, to large-scale communal participation where the culmination of many small acts achieves mythic proportions. Christo and Jean-Claude create monumental works of art that often take several years, thousands of people and millions of dollars to realize. They work with government officials, various companies, private landowners and an army of volunteers to transform urban and rural environments, bringing contemporary art to a mass audience. One of their first works of this kind was Running Fence, a 40 kilometer curtain of yellow fabric cutting across the hills of Northern California. The art project consisted of 42 months of collaborative efforts, 18 public hearings, three sessions at the Superior Courts of California, the drafting of a 450-page environmental impact report, and the temporary use of the hills, the sky and the ocean at California's Bodega Bay. They've also wrapped the Reichstag in Berlin in a white shroud, installed over a thousand blue umbrellas in a landscape outside Tokyo swathed 11 islands off the coast of Miami in pink fabric and inscribed New York Central Park with hundreds of gates hung with orange fabric. According to Christo, the extraordinary part of these projects is that they really build their own energy, their own relation to a great number of people. They involve the community, politicians and the people who help us realize these projects. That's why it is not just one person like myself or Jean-Claude screaming, we want to wrap the Reichstag. 
On the contrary, there's a huge support by many German friends. According to Christo, this project developed something that normally painting and sculpture do not have. This project developed participatory public. Usually, when people go to galleries and museums, they see the work of art, they like what they like and go away. For days and days, for months and months, years and years, thousands, sometimes millions of people, like in the case of the Pont Neuf and the Reichstag, think in advance how awful the Reichstag would look if they were against the project, or how fantastic the Reichstag would look if they liked the project. And in a way, the project develops this extraordinary participatory public who we do not have in normal art forms. Their 1977 to 78 project, Wrapped Walkways, consisted of 12,540 square metres of saffron coloured nylon fabric covering 4.4 kilometres of formal garden walkways and jogging paths in Kansas City, Missouri. What do you think the participants' engagement with this work was? What was the significance of walking through this park on these renewed pathways covered with the fabric? According to Christo, the walkway was made in cement and gravel and we put one millimetre of folded fabric between your feet and the surface. You never watch what you walk on. Now, everybody was obliged to be aware of how he or she walked on that fabric. Otherwise, they would break their neck because there are many folds in the fabric. In the most ordinary and banal process of walking, suddenly people were obliged to readjust themselves, to rethink how they moved through that space, think every path, every step.